Hello, Jabi, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to Ambedkar Lecture Series for November. And uh, we have Professor Thorat here. Uh, Professor Sukte Thorat is a renowned faculty in the field of economics. He has served as a chairperson of the Indian Council of Social Research and University Grants Commission in India. He's received several awards like Padan Sri for his work and contributions towards public service for marginalized groups and minorities. He has authored several books on caste discrimination in economics, health, and education. Today, he will be deliberating on economies of caste specifically. In India, caste is one of the major axes of inequality embedded in the society. It leads to exclusion manifested in all spheres of life, including access to services and control over resources. Caste as a socially constructed category determines the inclusion or exclusion for opportunities due to existing hierarchies of power and privilege. Thus, caste as a structure of advantage and disadvantage determines socio-economic and political status of communities and individuals in India and South Asia. Access to agricultural land, the non-agricultural labor market, financial resources like banking and microfinance resources and developing rural cooperatives that we see is shaped by one's position in the society or in the caste system. The caste who have had historic control over the means of production like land, wealth, assets, and natural resources continue to have access to majority of resources in today's neoliberal society, including benefits from development schemes of government. So quoting from Professor Thorat's paper itself, quote, in order to develop appropriate remedies to eliminate caste inequality, we need to understand precisely how caste affects individuals' economic lives and how the economy interacts with caste values and attitudes and what behavior produces persistent inequality and deprivation for groups based on their caste, ethnicity, or religion. End quote. So let's hear more from Professor Thorat, welcoming him with a loud applause. Yeah. Because the chair can't be moved. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening to all of you. Well, let me first uh, thank the Boston Study Group, uh, which has invited me to speak on or share my views on economics of caste system. Uh, Boston Study Group, I know, is is extremely active organization here in city of Boston and Cambridge. Uh, they have been uh, collaborating with the initiative that the Brandeis University has started uh, about six years before namely the, the annual conference or conference uh, uh, on the legacy of uh, unfinished legacy of Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, they have been supporting this uh, activity for from the very beginning. And also, obviously, the, the Boston study group is taking many activities, as I understand. And this is one of the activities, I think, monthly lecture on Dr. Ambedkar is one of the activity. So I, I quite appreciate this, uh, whereby you uh, uh, keep the consciousness alive mm -hmm. about the problem of the private group in India and elsewhere. Uh, therefore, my appreciation to all of you, the member as well as the organizer. Now, I was told that I should speak on uh, economics of caste system today. Uh, and therefore, I agreed to speak on the economic aspects uh, aspect of caste. What are the aspects that we, we 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 can sort of deal with as far as the economic aspect of the caste system is concerned? Let me first uh, uh, 
briefly uh, share with you the the foundation of the caste system or major principle of the caste system major feature of the caste system and how economics is involved into it and economics is involved in, in into it in a major major way uh, you know way back in 1916 when dr ambedkar wrote uh, he celebrated a essay on uh, on theories of caste system and his growth in columbia university as back as 1960 he made a very profound statement at that point of time that the caste is a enclosed class and if you open it up uh, you open the caste you will find underneath uh, uh, the economic foundation to the caste system this is not to say that there is no social foundation but uh, the major aspect of the caste system is also economics so let us see uh, what what are the feature and then i'll 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 also uh, disclose the various aspect of the caste system from its economic point of view now caste system uh, can be defined in number of ways but it's better i think we can uh, recognize some of the feature of the caste system and Uh, recognizing certain feature pointing out certain feature of the caste system itself give the meaning of the caste system now caste system involve two two three important features first is that it is a division of the hindus into groups called caste uh, to begin with uh, there were four groups in manusmriti uh, but later on uh, uh, the 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 untouchables group or ex untouchable group emerged from shudras so uh, there are altogether five broad categories and within each of these categories there are several uh, sub caste so so division of people into certain groups uh, social group is one of the feature but the caste system doesn't involve only division of people into different group it also involved um uh, assignment of rights uh, to each of the groups uh, fix the right of the each of the caste as it were uh, that that right in more social civic political economic and religious rights this is the second feature that we should uh, try to understand the third feature is that these rights uh, assign across the caste group for each of the caste group uh or the entitlement for the right of each of the caste group is decided or prescribed uh that entitlement that assignment of right is done in an unequal manner that the some caste have more and other caste have less in fact the in in fact the assignment of the right is done in a hierarchical manner in a graded manner uh, it is not caste system is not doesn't involve haves and have not strictly speaking it does have haves and have not you have people with uh, wealth and you have people without wealth but these are not the bivariate classification there are five castes whose rights are assigned in an unequal manner but uh, hierarchical manner who so dr ambedkar would call uh, called it as a graded inequality so you have for example some rights to the brahmi all the rights as a matter of fact uh, but as you go down in the caste hierarchy from brahmi to kshatriya and kshatriya to vaishya vaishya to shudra and untouchable who are at the bottom of the caste hierarchy the right goes down right get reduced so it's a hierarchical or graded inequality Uh, unlike uh, unlike the bipolar uh, inequality have and have not poor and non poor uh, this inequality is based on the graded principle and that is why it's very very difficult to remove it because uh, if there is a bipolar inequality if there are poor and non poor you can organize the poor against the uh, uh, non poor or who own the means of production but here uh, Uh, the the economic right being hierarchical each one each group is satisfied at its own level i'll come to that later but what you have to understand is that that the caste system is based on unequal assignment of all right economic social religious political 
in an unequal manner but in hierarchical manner this is the this is the core feature of the um, uh, caste system and there are two more feature which you should remember uh, that is that caste system uh, the the caste system the principle of the caste system which governed the caste system also in laid down certain mechanism to retain the caste system mm -hmm. to enforce the caste system uh, in the system itself you don't require the outside forces to maintain the system oh. now this is something called mechanism of social ostracism oh. that the um, there are certain code and custom and principle which define the caste system, let down the caste system, or uh, determine the caste system. They serve as a foundation, founding principle of the caste system. If there is a deviation from those principle and rule of the caste system, uh, there is an element of punishment by the society. And that for, uh, punishment is excommunication. If you violate the rule, uh, then there is a punishment to the family and sometimes to the caste as a whole. But to the family, for example, if you if my, you go for intercaste marriages, you know, high caste with a low caste girl or a boy, uh, then there are punishment, physical punishment, social uh, isolation, exclusion. Social exclusion is a very powerful punishment. Dr. Ambedkar call it a, a social death. In fact, no member of the particular caste will keep relation with them. Whatever type of relations are there. So there is an internal mechanism to retain the caste system, to enforce the caste system. You don't require police, you don't require any other mechanism. This is the fourth feature of the caste system, which, which uh, bring a lot of stubbornness and rigidity in the caste system. Uh, and the last important feature is, which uh, we must remember, is the is that uh, the caste system has a, a uh, philosophical base in religion. Religious philosophy of Hinduism provide a justification for the caste system. Uh, this is a very, very unique feature. So caste system is, is a social organization of the Hindus and Hindu religious philosophy support it, justified on the principle of whatever morality they have. Now, as you know, all of you know, I need not repeat it that <coughs> The caste system is supposed to be of a divine origin, created by the God. Okay. And various castes emerge from the different part of body of the God. You know, Brahmin from the mouth, Kshatriyas from the arms, Vaishya from the thighs, and Shudras from the feet. Uh, so, from the it has a divine origin. It's created by the God itself. And therefore, to practice the caste system is a religious act. Um, Anything that you justify on the basis of basis of any principle, you can discuss the principles and argue out that principles are wrong. But here it is a matter of faith. And to challenge the faith and to discuss the faith is very difficult. Any religion for that matter, not only Hindus. So there is a philosophical uh, justification in, uh, in the religious philosophy of Hinduism to the caste system. Those who are interested should read Ambedkar, very classical figure of Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, issue of Dr. Ambedkar, that is philosophy of Hinduism. And it led, it analyzed the various principles of Hindu religion, uh, which justify the caste system, which serve as a foundation of the caste system. So these are the four, five features which are very important, and this gives you uh, what caste, caste is, what caste constitutes. To summarize then, is that the, the caste system is the division of the people, which involve assignment of the, rights, economic, social, political, religious, and that assignment is made in an unequal manner, that some are more and some are less. Therefore, the caste system is based on the principle of inequality. Uh, and that is the morality behind the caste system, that inequality is the foundation of the caste system in all sphere of life. But this inequality is also graded inequality. That is very, very important. It's a, the, the, the sociologists would call it a hierarchical inequality, but Dr. Prabhupada used the graded equality that the, 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 as you go down in the caste system, the rights goes down. And therefore, untouchables who are at the bottom of the caste hierarchy suffer the most because they were denied all, all the rights. I'll come to the rights uh, later. So 
this is the the basic principle of the caste system that is based on the principle of inequality and that there is a mechanism to enforce it that there is a justification from the religious philosophy in hinduism therefore it being a lot of solidity to the caste system many other institutions have disappeared slavery after enactment of law here in usa had disappeared there are there are remnants of slavery there are modern forms of slavery that is another matter there are books around modern forms of slavery but the slavery in its classical form because of the act has, has almost disappeared but that's not the case with untouchability of the system we have a act untouchability offense act of 1955 prevention of atrocity act of 1989 uh, and yet despite the act the untouchability and caste discrimination persist because its foundation is uh, something different now after having look at the uh, features of the caste system and and getting getting some meaning of the caste system uh let me come to the 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 principle uh, the foundations uh, principle of uh, governance of the caste system now i have said that the caste system is based on principle of inequality uh, in entitlement of rights social economic political and religious now the 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 economic inequality across the caste group inequality in the economic right is one of the most important and critical feature of the caste system in fact i would say that it is the fundamental uh, foundation it is the foundation of the caste system had the caste system been based only on the unequal division of cultural religious and social rights probably it would have disappeared much more rapidly than it is uh, but because of the economic foundation of the caste system the caste system remain uh, very strong and it it remains as uh yes stubborn institution and therefore dr ambedkar disclose open up what he says that the uh, caste is a enclosed class mm. now let us look at the class character the economic character of the class uh, of caste system i'll also refer to the social but uh, let us concentrate on the caste as such because the topic is today the economics of the caste system now the caste system as i say assign economic rights assign rights and particularly economic rights to different caste but it does it in an unequal manner what are those economic rights and how they are distributed or assigned unequally across the caste scope and as a result it result into a massive economic inequality poverty uh, and the deprivation to the class, to the to the caste which are denied the basic economic right the economic right which are based on the principle of inequality and unequal assignment include ownership of means of production mm. ownership of capital asset uh agricultural land in those days mm. now even today uh, is a major capital asset which is which generates income enterprises non farm enterprises it may be business or it may be industries trade commerce which also include the enterprise enterprises and business and services employment casual employment regular employment quality employment there is an inequality in the type of employment you are engaging i'll come to that later in greater detail mm. uh, then of course there are other uh, uh, rights which enable the growth of human beings economic uh, uh, progress and most important is of course the uh, right to education mm. these are these are the these are the economic rights which are assigned in an unequal manner across the caste group when we talk of employment we also talk of wages so the inequality in the assignment of economic right in terms of unequal ownership of capital asset which gives you income a land and enterprise and business employment wages and education these are uh, 
uh, unequally distributed it has given given in a much more uh, voluminous way to some caste and it, uh, they are denied uh, to the lower caste let's take briefly we we described <coughs> If you take the ownership of capital asset or what we call in a simple word occupation, then you then you discover that uh, the ownership of asset is clearly defined. That is that the occupation uh, of uh, right to education and to teach, to to educate and to teach, especially religious preaching, is an exclusive right of the man. Uh, that right is denied to all the three caste. Down below, Chhatriya's only job is to defence, to defend the community and society. Uh, they have a right to education, but they cannot use education as a profession. They can learn, but they cannot use education as a as a profession as such. That right is with only Brahmi. Down below, you come with Shia, Their right uh, is. Is to undertake business. Originally, they were given right to livelihood, a right to livestock, agriculture, and business. But increasingly, what has happened is that uh, the the right to li right to livestock and agriculture was transferred to the Shudras. Right. Uh, but Shudra and Vaishya do not have a right to take education. They the wishes can take education again. They cannot use the education as a as a profession, as an instrument of your progress. Shudras, of course, were denied right to education as such. In fact, in Manusmuti, Shudra had no right whatsoever. No right to land, no right to enterprises, no right to education. Their only job is to serve the three caste above them. But later on, what has happened is that Pati Shudras or untouchable emerge out of Shudras. And all those disability which are mentioned in Manusmati for the Shudras are imposed on the untouchables. And Shudra somehow in the course of the history got the right to livestock and got right to agriculture. That is why most of the OBCs today have uh, agricultural land. But the untouchable at the bottom of the uh, bottom at the bottom of the caste hierarchy have no right, economic right whatsoever. Uh, I do not want to quote directly from the Manusmati, but whatever I am saying is is codified in literal term in Manusmati, that untouchable cannot accumulate the wealth. They cannot have access to education. Their only job is to serve the three castes above them and now four castes above them, including the, including, including the Shudras. Then, in return to the service, they are to be given some kind of a subsistence wages or income by the high caste. Uh, uh, in fact, it is very clearly mentioned that uh, whatever leftover food is there of the higher caste should be given to the untouchables. Yeah. Uh, whatever left their clothes uh, are there, they, they should be given to the untouchable. And but in no case they should accumulate wealth. That accumulation of wealth is against the code of the Manusmriti and that it causes a lot of pain to the Brahmin. Their only job is to serve the Brahmin. It is not mentioned that their only job is to serve Kshatriya, Vaishya, or Shudra. Mm -hmm. In the text, it is mentioned that their only job is to serve the Brahmin. Now you can see that the economic right, that is ownership of capital asset, education, and employment is highly unequally distributed and untouchable have none of this. Their only job is to serve the uh, four high caste. Now, uh, so you can see that the, the caste which laid down the uh, course and rules with respect to the ownership of property right, uh, how does it involve the distribution of unequal distribution of economic right? and thereby creating classes in a hierarchical manner. That is what Dr. Ambedkar said. We are disclosing, we are opening that box uh, as a matter of fact. But there are other things uh, with respect to the untouchable because their situation is pretty bad. 
worse than that of a slave as a matter of fact dr ambedkar has essay on slavery and untouchability and he compares and how he he feel that the untouchability is worse than the slavery he has given many reason i won't go into that but there is one point that i would like to mention and that has come to me uh, you know this is because i am working on this project uh, with the uh, initiative taken by the harvard university the one of the important facts that we discover is the following dr ambedkar did mention in philosophy of hinduism that hinduism recognized slavery but slavery was again in a graded manner uh that the untouchable can be the slave of every caste uh all the castes about them but the slavery was graded the brahmin can be the slave of only brahmin kshatriya can be the slave slave of brahmin and kshatriya vaishya can be the slave of vaishya kshatriya and the brahmin and shudra can be the slave of uh, shudra and the other caste about them so that is how the even slavery was in a graded manner but what is important is the new fact which has not been brought out as clearly as it should be uh, that there was a slavery in a general way in hindu society but that slavery was based on the uh, individuals you know on of the certain certain people are considered to be slave uh, there was a slavery associated with debt there was a slavery that emerged out of the war you defeat certain group group and those who are defeated you can take them as a slave uh there was a slave market now this covered the entire society so you will have a slave uh, from different caste but the unique feature of the slavery which has not been highlighted is that that the untouchable as a whole as a caste were declared as slave ethnic caste based slavery others were individual so slavery was based on individual but here as far as the untouchable sir concerned the community as a whole was declared as slave and subject to serve the uh, high caste now there is a very powerful literature lot of literature for south india for kerala tamil nadu andhra even in the north india that how untouchable as a community as a whole we are considered slave and slave means is a is is a additional deprivation slave means that you are not free you don't have individual freedom at all you are purchased and your freedom is gone your life is controlled by the slave owner so the life of the schedule caste uh, untouchable as a community was owned by the uh, sometime landlord but basically uh, the high caste now that really brings a very pathetic situation to the untouchables uh, if you go through the to the record uh, Uh, you see that this aspect of slavery in addition to the denial of equal right and deprivation uh, uh, the slavery aspect is was 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 there we we'll have to bring out those aspect a lot more in a, in a greater detail now one point i would like to mention is that although the caste system is based on the unequal ownership of rights economic rights property employment entrepreneurship land education one exception is made but that exception you must understand that exception is that although there is a specific occupation from the brahmin but if the situation demands brahmin can have any occupation except except the wage labor or casual labor if they don't survive by teaching they can also uh, take military as a profession and that is why you see the brahmin as a military journal or in the military and even that point of time in ancient time if they cannot survive by any uh, their occupation they can also undertake cultivations it's very clearly mentioned in manusmriti they can even undertake business so you can see that while for the other caste their economic right are defined they cannot change the occupations are hereditary you cannot change your occupation for but the exception is made for the brahmin that in the event of distress they can they have a freedom to undertake any kind of occupation and therefore you see uh, 
you take many part of india the brahmins are agri- where agriculture is and not agriculture is they are into business they are into military if the caste put restriction on occupational diversification change how come brahmins are into all occupation but that's not the case with the that's not the case with the untouchable or that's not the case with the lower caste this feature should be uh, uh, understood now the meaning of this this feature is that is that the motive behind the caste system is economics there is a social motive also high social status superior being but at the at the root of it is is also economics so there is a material base as dr ambedkar has argued there is a material base to the caste system and had there been no material base caste system should have been could have uh, changed a lot more rapidly than it has but the material base that is the high caste having an economic power and untouchable not having a economic power make it lot more difficult for the untouchable to change the caste system or being the changes in the caste system the economic power of the high caste over the untouchable put lot of restriction on changing the caste system now this is this is the economic theory of the caste system that caste system beside an equal right in social culture and religious sphere it is also solidly based on unequal entitlement of economic rights and particularly the uh, ownership of property income earning asset employment and education uh, massive inequality you can see and the denial of all these right to untouchable have turned them into a very very pathetic section of the indian society uh, they have no right either to property or to military or to education besides being the fact that they are considered excluded uh, isolated segregated uh, and a lesser human being uh, polluting and impure that also added to their deprivation but the had they had uh, some land right to business the change could have been of a different nature you can see now the moment the untouchable got some access to the regular salary employment through the reservation there is a rise of the lower middle class and middle class but that was not the uh, uh, basic feature of the caste system so i think to summarize that the caste system is based on the entitlement of uh, inequality in the entitlement of economic rights and that the motive behind this and um, uh, inequality in economic entitlement is economic a greed that we should have more and the other should have none so there may be a spiritual motive the motive of high social status but behind but most important is is the economic motive the material motive and that should be uh, kept in mind so if there is an opposition to economic policies like reservation the reason is that that the high caste believe that the their privileges in employment public and private employment regular salary are been encroach by the lower caste otherwise why should why why there should be opposition to it now this is as far as the theory economic theory of caste is concerned economic foundation of the caste is concerned but this is the past and this is the theory there are two aspects which we need to discuss as far as the practice is concerned one is that this unequal assignment of economic right had a devastating consequences on the untouchable particularly and to some extent on the other backward caste now the result was quite clear that the untouchable right from the beginning of the introduction of the caste system uh, it resulted into assetlessness not having any ownership of capital asset income earning asset like land and industry and business it result into a massive illiteracy among the shadow caste uh, untouchables and being un- being illiterate had no capability to take a regular salary job in any case they were not allowed to have a regular salary job but the, the the education which enable you to take a good quality job that was also denied so that most of the shell, uh, untouchable would be casual labor rather slave labor 
beside the fact that there was a social exclusion, untouchability, uh, isolation, segregation, that was definitely part of the untouchable. But in economic terms, they were deprived by all sources of economic mobility, property, employment, and education. And that you can see even today. Much of my work, which I began in early 90s, uh, by collecting the data from here and there, was to see the ownership of uh, um, capital asset, ownership of property, income earning asset, employment, uh, education. And whichever data you take, what you discover is this massive inequality, massive deprivation of the untouchable uh, from the ownership of means of uh, income, uh, education, and employment. So you see at the end of it is the bulk of them are casual labor. Bulk of them, despite the law, are bonded labor. Bulk of them, despite the, the law, bonded labor, attached labor. Uh, so these are modern form of slavery, you might say, bonded labor, attached labor, uh, and there are reason for that. Manusputi was written somewhere around my, uh, BC 185 or 200. There is a general agreement among everybody. Uh, now, how many years? If you add 200 years to the, to, to, till the, till the British period when the untouchable, or when the untouchable, untouchability act was brought in, it was brought in 1955, but Britishers made some relaxation. Nowhere in the world that the, the institution like this was practiced for the, for about 2000 years or little more than 2000 years. Slavery was for 450 years or around that. The caste system, which involved denial of property right to untouchable particularly, is the only system in the world which has been there for a, such a long period of time. And that's the reason why the situation of untouchable is pathetic and, and uh, beyond, beyond limitation. So this was the outcome. Uh, assetlessness, illiteracy, Heavy dependence on casual labor, exploitative labor. These are the main features that we can see uh, uh, among the untouchable. And therefore, uh, mobility and development for them is extremely, extremely difficult. Now, how, how we, have, we have several laws now. Uh, it began with, during the British period to a certain extent. We can say that in early 20s, certain uh, rights were introduced by the Britishers and others where individual rights were preserved. Individual rights were legally recognized. Right to property, right to education, right to business, right to enterprises. And it opened up opportunity for the untouchable, particularly in the urban areas. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, constitution <coughs> came in 1950, constitution recognized equality, constitution banned untouchability, it is included in the fundamental rights. Uh, it specifically emphasizes the principle of non-discrimination based on caste, religion, color, and others. We brought that into constitutions, equal opportunity and equality before law, uh, and also empowered the government through the directive principle to develop policies for the mm -hmm. betterment of these sections. But despite all this, there has been improvement to a certain extent. I don't have a time to give you data. There has been some improvement. But the original feature of the caste system in a comparative framework still remain there. Mm. The bulk of them are without agriculture land. Bulk of them are without enterprise. <laughs> bulk of them are uh, employed as a casual labor and much less in the regular salaried labor. Whatever little employment they got is in public sector, government sector, because of reservation. A bulk of them in private sector are in formal sector on contractual basis with the lower wages. Uh, in casual labor, quite significant number of them are attached labor, uh, forced labor. Some of them are bonded labor. So the situation, uh, 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 despite improvement, uh, the situation uh, uh, the uh, remain the same. The predominant characteristics uh, remain the same. Now, 
there is another feature that we, we must recognize that although this law have been passed which allow the right to property to everybody right to education to everybody right to quality employment to everybody the caste restriction continue to play roles despite the law in economic sphere i am not talking of social sphere in social sphere we have two act protectability of rights act which was renamed rename as the protection of civil right act uh, 1955 act and then in 89 we had the prevention of atrocity act so in social sphere to provide a equality and discouraging uh, discrimination we have that act anybody who suffer from discrimination can go to the court of law but in economic sphere uh, we have uh, laws now which provide equal opportunity equal legal right to everybody you can buy land you can buy this enterprises you can indulge into business you can take say, access education you can try for a regular salaried job these are the occupation which is really pro- prohibited today but caste system caste restriction on acquiring economic right and education right and quality employment persist in a indirect manner through economic discrimination in the market and non market institution so the caste legacy of the caste system the spillover of the caste system uh, persist in the economic sphere and much of my work is on economic discrimination how much is the time okay 10 huh? so much of the uh, much of my work is on economic discrimination because we have not paid attention to economic discrimination we have paid attention to only social discrimination because there are two laws mm-hmm. now if you look at the economic discrimination whatever little evidence that we have today uh, that indicate that the economic discrimination persists mm-hmm. let me very briefly uh, say that whatever little uh, literature that we have that indicate that the untouchable face discrimination in rural area in purchasing land yeah. even if you are willing to pay the market price uh, you have a difficulty in buying the land the high caste would prefer to sell the land the people of their own caste in enterprises it is diffi- uh, the untouchable also face difficulties in starting business starting enterprises mm-hmm. there are several difficulties that they, they they face in the market in sale and purchase of the goods and commodities Uh, there is a literature now available mm. in the rural area particularly uh, if you start uh, the, the business related to grocery mm. business related to eatery uh, the demand remain confined to the scheduled caste person only the high caste would hardly buy groceries from the uh, from the untouchable shop the enter- high caste would hardly Uh, buy the food from the eatery shop mm. or restaurant started by the scheduled caste same is the case with transport there is a study uh, high caste would prefer to hire a transport auto rickshaw or taxi from the people of their own caste so discrimination in business there is a book by ashim prakash you must read that published by oxford those who are interested he interviewed he has interviewed and studied 99 90 dalit entrepreneurs and brought mm. came with a discrimination being faced by the entrepreneurs in india in agriculture of course uh, you have you you face discrimination selectively not only in land but sale of output and purchase of input therefore your productivity is low the similar discrimination is found in employment in the private sector there are studies now which brings out that the scheduled caste face discrimination in seeking the employment in the in the private sector caste play a role uh, so you can see that the the legacy of caste system is play out in the modern world and the result of that is that there are restriction the untouchable face restriction in acquiring the means of production in acquiring uh, employment as a result there Uh, they get concentrated into casual labor their income is low poverty is high you take any indicator of human development you take income per capita you take poverty ratio you take level of malnutrition you take le- the mortality rate of children you take anemia 
whatever indicator of human development laid down under billion development goal or sustainable development goal the untouchable come at the bottom except you have to exclude the tribal i am talking within the caste system so this is because the they continue to face the economic discrimination uh, whenever they try to get access to this try to uh, get the ownership of this uh, economic right now therefore the, the there is a continuous impact of this now discrimination also prevail in the non market institutions there is a lot of research on market institutions but non market institution like education public institution involved in the rendering the health services public institution supplying the fair uh, through fair price of food these are not a market institution these are non market institution they work on behalf of the government and supply certain services the untouchable face discrimination in all these schemes there are studies now which which point out the discrimination education has become a very hot subject for discrimination in india Mm. yeah so you can see that both market and non market institution uh, the untouchable continue to face in various degree the caste discrimination which involve denial of equal right and as, as a result of which uh, they remain as settlers they remain less educated <coughs> and their income is low and their poverty is high they continue to depend on the casual labor which is which is a very low pay uh activity no government has recognized this uh, <coughs> this problems and therefore we develop policies it's not that the government has not recognized right from 1950s to 60s government has taken certain step to distribute the land to the former untouchable there are programs to start the businesses uh, there are there are special effort to increase the access to education and increase the ownership of income earning asset uh, so there are all these effort uh, to increase the capability and ownership of means of production <coughs> also after having got some education and skill through the reservation you the, the government provide access in proportion to the population there is the initiative on the private side of the private sector which have introduced the voluntary affirmative action policies where they help in education and building the capability to undertake entrepreneurship uh, but uh, uh, the efforts are fairly inadequate and that 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 result into untouchable be untouchable remaining at the bottom of the hierarchy there are no drastic uh, measures Uh, there was a land reform, and despite that, bulk of the scheduled castes are landless. Uh, there are effort to increase the entrepreneurship, but very small proportion, about thirteen to percent or fourteen percent of their entrepreneur at all India level. There are special schemes for education, and yet the enrollment ratio at school and higher secondary and higher education is much lower compared to others. So these these schemes are there, but then uh, the the volume and the access being less uh, the impact is not uh, such that it will reduce the inequality between the high caste and the untouchable therefore the inequality the caste inequality uh, continue to persist in a modern form uh, even today mm. i think these are some of the aspects that i wanted to share with you there is lot of statistics uh, which justify all this and we prove all this but uh, i thought i should avoid statistics and give you the major mm. uh, conclusions and major features thank you yeah Thank you, Professor Thoret. This was an amazing uh, <clears throat> deliberation. Uh, this was really um, an important um, aspect that we have, as a as a, a group, haven't been able to talk much about. And um, just to reinforce what you were saying, that the material base to caste system, uh, that is something which is which is very. Uh, insightful the uh, sometimes the words need to be really put out to have that emphasis um and since uh, uh you know you touched a little bit about um how in the private sector uh, some um voluntary affirmative action policies are being thought about so one of the things that i was thinking through um the conversation 
was uh, these reservations or affirmative action have been set up in the public sector. So those have some um, you know, space to have uh, safety nets or safety guards. But in the private sector, um, those don't exist. So, uh, so if you want to finish your thought about, I know you were talking a little bit, touched a little bit upon uh, private sector. If you want to finish your thought about how private sector is doing certain things to bring in um, affirmative action policy. Well, there are two points which I will share with you quickly. <clears throat> There are two instrument, policy instrument, which has brought improvement in the life of untouchable, sex untouchable. There is some mobility. There is a rise of uh, limited lower middle class and middle class and very tiny uh, high class somewhat. This mobility has been because of two factors. One is the education. And after having got education, liberal and professional, through the channel of reservation, uh, there is an secure jobs to a certain extent. 16% for scheduled cars, 8% for scheduled time. The education has been possible. Both primary, middle, higher secondary, and higher education is possible simply because there has been public institutions. Mm -hmm. The education is under the state. Uh, control. So primary uh, school education is basically government. Mm. College education is government plus the private aided, but private aided just work on the same principle, same fee. So these public institution institutions have enabled the access to education to this poorer section among the um, among the untouchables and even others also. An improved education and through the channel of reservation they. Uh, got the jobs in the public sector and the government sector. Now, these instruments are being eroded very rapidly. Mm. One is that there is a privatization of the school sector, education, mm. and privatization of higher education by making the, making the education expensive and beyond the reach of the poor. Mm. There are certain, certain schemes for the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe student whereby fees are paid by the government, by some state, but not by all, that come as a relief. But by and large, if you take all the education sector, mm. the access has been reduced right. uh, because of the privatization and edu education being quite expensive. Yes. So the education which has enabled and developed an educated class among the scheduled class who take advantage of jobs through reservation, that education is now getting uh, reduce mm. number one. Number two is that the the government and the public sector uh, has been a major source of employment right. to this yes. educa so called mm. educated uh, section. Now there is a privatization of the public undertaking. As a result, the share of the government uh, government job has been reduced mm. considerably. Uh, there is a very important article of mine in EPW. Mm. Uh, uh, prejudice against reservation. I have given all the mm -hmm. figures in this. Those who are interested can read it about one and one year before. Now, so there is a privatization as a result, the public sector job, government sector job has been reduced. Mm. As a result, the 16% of that reduced is very small number. Mm. Second important thing is that even those government sectors which are present today, there the government has introduced the appointment on the basis of contract. Mm -hmm permanent position uh, are there, but the appointment of C and uh, D categories of job has been made uh, to a large extent on the contract basis. One yearly basis, two yearly basis, and there is no reservation on the posts which are on contract. So there is a, this is a backdoor privatization by the government institutions. So now what you find is with the sinking of the government sector, sinking of the education because of privatization, this policy instrument of reservation has, is having a very minimum access uh, uh, to the uh, section which are entitled for reservation. This is the one impact. Now as a result, in the early 90s when the program of privatization was introduced by the government at that point of time, uh, many of the Dalit academicians argued that 
privatization means de reservation mm. so there has to be some initiative on the part of the private sector or the government to have some some sort of affirmative action policy by the private sector mm. there was a debate for several years from 2003 to 2008 i was a part of that debate private sector would say that we appoint people only on the merit of messy on the basis of merit we don't discriminate mm. we provided evidence then private sector was lot some uh, on defensive and came forward and develop a policy what is called voluntary and self regulatory policy of affirmative action by the private sector in 2008 mm. that involved three component one is to promote education by giving scholarship mm. second promoting the professional education so that increasing the employability and third is to promote uh, self employment that is business and entrepreneurship among the scheduled caste and fourth is was wherever possible give some preference to the scheduled caste in employment hmm. this policy has been practiced now for last uh, to, to, to 2008 but this is voluntary and self regulated hmm. we do not know what is the status yeah. of this yeah. there was a review of this policy on annual basis during the upa2 government but in the last government there was no meeting there is no review whatsoever so we do not know as to where that this stand and so there is a constant demand that this affirmative action policy should be made accountable yeah. we must know what is happening and it should monitor and accountable if if the law is not there because everybody oppose law but at least make it accountable mm. at least make it transparent mm. so that is the issue right. uh, that uh, is there there are certain industries which are doing quite a lot of work we particularly tata forbus in india mm. uh, they they bring out what they do Oh. Uh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. So we'll open it to the audience for questions. Um, we can take questions as what? Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Professor <coughs> Tarak, you have done this work about uh, the private sector discrimination, right? Based on uh, the names and caste, you know. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? That was like around 2000, like I first read, and then there is also at the same time there was a study that came out, uh, you know, the expansion of our economy, whatever we are. India's growth story is all about sort of high tech jobs, right? Mm. I mean, IT jobs. That was the basic driver, and uh, there was a another study around the same time came out and said. the 80% of these new economy jobs are basically grabbed by the 20% of the upper you know i hate to call upper but dominant caste whereas the 80% of the lower population is only representing 20% so if you can talk you know that that's a growing economy hmm. uh, you know and in that i think these lower sections have a very little stake and very little going on and i know some of the remedies uh, it's it's a mind boggling the, the public sector itself you know it's reducing you know this, um the footprint and they're removing this you know like i am hmm. now they made autonomous and they will decide hmm. their own way whether to do so in this space i think uh, there should be a formidable effort to make private sector accountable you know hmm. in some fashion to do their social responsibility You know, I mean, reservation is the word that they use, but I mean, in US, they practice. It's, it's a diversity. They are take pride in talking about if you're African American mm. lady or Latino, they they proudly hire them with a the preferential treatment. They talk about it. They write about it. You know, like MIT, Harvard, they all talk about it. They take pride, and I don't know how that uh, you know value system is instilled into these companies. It is mm -hmm. some MNCs, you know, like IBM's of mm -hmm. the world. But they practice here, you know, Microsoft of the world, Google's of the world. If we can start somewhere there, I think we might have some chance. So just, I mean, I, I want your thoughts on, you know. Oh. Um, See, I, <coughs> the the point is that uh, the issue of discrimination in the labor market, particularly the regular salaried uh, jobs in the private sector. Uh, when there was a demand of some sort of reservation in the private sector private sector came with an uh, huge opposition that we respect merit we don't discriminate so there is no need for affirmative action policy even today the vice chairman of the planning commission niti ayog 
had opposed uh, affirmative action policy, which is there. Even that policy was opposed. Therefore, there were efforts by some of us individuals to provide an if evidence because on, on the face of it we see that there is a discrimination but we don't we do not have uh, empirical evidence the mainstream scholarship and the researcher do not touch this topic so in fact this was one of the reasons why we set up indian institute of dalit studies okay. to undertake research on the issues of the dalit so one of the area was of course uh, uh, the uh, to provide some empirical and statistical evidence in support of discrimination being practiced in the private sector, um, uh, one of the one of the author who highlighted based on secondary data, national sample survey was Madheshwaran. Um, uh, Catherine Newman also. Has yeah, that uh, Catherine 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 Newman's uh, story. I'll tell what what uh, oh, oh, yeah yeah. In fact, uh, Catherine Newman started a study uh, proposal to study the discrimination in the labor market. And she approached various institutions and finally selected the Indian Institute of Delhi studies for collaboration. And we did that collaborative study and we brought out, uh, she and me are the editors of that blog by cast, economic discrimination in the modern world. Yeah, yeah. But that book provides some evidence, as you, uh, you have asked. One is that. Now, the Madheshwaran's and Artwell article, the husband of uh, Catherine Newman. Oh. Yeah, uh, these articles brings out that there are differences in the wages between the high caste and the low caste. And they use the techniques and found out that about 30 35 percent of the differences are because of discrimination. They take identical people and they still found differences. So, 30 percent of differences in the wages uh, is because of the discrimination. Now we have done, myself and Madhishuran have, we have done a recent uh, estimate that there are differences in the employment rate uh, of the scheduled caste and the high caste and almost 80% of the differences are because of discrimination. There is a typical method of identifying, very credible method. I would not like to go into greater detail. So there has been an attempt to provide an evidence in to show that there is a discrimination in the private sector in employment. The paper that made a very uh, lot of air was, was the correspondence study, me, myself, and Atwell, again, the, the husband of the Catherine Newman. Uh, uh, we have an article in that newspaper, uh, in that book. Is that what we did was that we took seven, eight newspaper, English newspaper, Times of India, Indian Express, Hindu, Hindustan Times, and we take the advertisement into in, in those newspaper put up by the private sector. Mm. And we send the artificial biodatas as a response to those. It's called a correspondence study. Mm -hmm. What we did, we had a four pair, scheduled caste, Muslim, high caste Brahmin, and one another fourth pair was high caste Brahmin with a low education and scheduled caste with a higher education. Mm. Say Brahmin with BA and Dalit with MA. Mm -hmm. And the biodatas of all these four sets were sent with exactly equal qualification. Not only qualification, but the background also, parental background, English medium, and all that. But they were sent as if they were sent from a different addresses. Mm. It was monitored in the institute. So for the year, we sent about 5,000 applications. And what we studied would be nothing but the callback for the interview. Mm. And what you discover is that with the identical qualification, the probability of getting an interview call for the scheduled cost was 65% less compared to the high cost. Muslim also, 35%. But what is important is that, that the high caste employees with a lesser qualification with BA got more call back than, than the scheduled cost who were with the postgraduate education master. Mm -hmm. So we, we throw out that. And, but there are other evidences also that discrimination persists uh, as such. Now, as far as the private sector is concerned, now gradually the private sector has began to recognize. There is no data. The CIA had conducted a, their internal survey, came out with the statistic that we have enough of scheduled cars and all that. But I think with all these, we don't have a data uh, at the moment. But so the, the private sector has shown some interest now. 
at least uh, confederation of indian industry i do not know about the associate chamber of commerce mm. or fiki mm. federation of indian chamber of commerce they don't discuss they don't talk i i have not been yeah, yeah. cii is doing i have done a study for cii suggesting them what, what should they do and i have been invited at least by two industrial group tata and forbes and they are doing um, uh, some activities some mm. this and there is an element of sincerity there but the point is uh, that uh, you know cii has 10000 member mm. business entrepreneurs and this this member have to sign certain code the way they, they do in usa that we won't in, we will respect only merit we won't discriminate this is that thing 30 is 30 code they have to sign and how many of they have signed <laughs> nine only 900 out of 10000 mm. so so the point is that the is being a voluntary there is no uh, obligation on you so these the 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 coverage of affirmative action policy we do not know uh, to be very fair therefore you require certain kind of monetary if you oppose law okay but at least there should be transparency accountability and monetary mm -hmm. without law that what are you doing should be known to the people put before the facts what you have done yeah. that is not being done but now there is a some people who say that yes hmm. because they are internally recognize that there is there are limited responses now i have i have in participated in their conference and told to them for example northern ireland as a affirmative action policy for catholic hmm. they are in catholic are in minority probably yes uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the protest and then there is a lot of discussion uh, discrimination there so they have set up an equal opportunity office mm. and what does the office does they ask all the entrepreneurs in northern ireland to give the data of the employee by the denomination catholic or protestant mm. and what do they do they do nothing in an area where the catholic population is say 50 percent or so is the share of the catholic is 50 percent mm. or 45 percent if not they will send a polite letter to the enterprises mm. that there is no diversity in proportion to the population, uh, religious population in your industry. Mm. Confidential communication. The industry get get damn scared that if this letter find the yes, way out, what that will that happen? Way. Now these are the indirect ways of monitoring without law. Mm. So I think there is a need for for uh, for some sort of a monitoring mechanism. Which is which may not be legal binding, mm -hmm. but that will that will bring accountability, transparency, increase the wider participation of all the sector. My feeling is that the discrimination in job is immense. Mm -hmm. Recent estimates, as I said, you the 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 discrimination uh, account almost for uh, say seventy five percent of differences in the employment rate between high caste and the scheduled caste. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm very struck with your account of just the stubborn persistence of caps. It seems really clear from the evidence. As someone who's relatively new to this study, and not myself, it's really important. I find when I talk to fellow scholars who are, are of Indian origin, they push back on my discussion of cast mm -hmm. in its emerging form, the mm -hmm. kind of arguments that you make. So I'm kind of curious about what resistance do you get to your arguments? For me, it comes in three forms. Mm -hmm. Cast is much more complex. And you discovered, you discussed a clear five level gradation. But, oh no, it's too complex. You can't possibly understand it. There's really mm -hmm. a thousand casts and it varies by village. And how could you possibly speak to that? Mm -hmm. The second pushback I get is that it's really all explained by colonialism and post-coloniality, <laughs> the British fault and the West's fault. Mm -hmm. Plenty of faults there, but it seems like there's still a strong job story. And finally, of course, if you're from the U.S. where race is bad, so who are you to speak? So I get this pushback. What's the third point? That, the, that you know, caste is no worse than race is in the okay. West, <laughs> so let's not discuss it. So all these are ways to bracket, remove, or silence the kind of front and center discussion of caste that you're giving us. So I'm kind of curious, what kind of resistance to your arguments do you encounter? And what kind of things can I say as a newer mm -hmm. scholar to my 
Tory minutia in this area when encountering those pushbacks against these strong arguments about the stubborn persistence of class. Mm. Just uh, well, the uh, the. The stubbornness is there. I mean, it, the the fact of persistence of caste in modified form. Caste has changed, certainly changed. Many features of his caste have, have been reduced and uh, are no more there. But there are important features there which persist, and these are negative features. Uh, so stubbornness is there. There is a data uh, that brings out. But the point that you mentioned is that there is an there is an indifference and resistance on the part of the high caste academician to undertake that. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we, I'm not making a statement based on the research or study, but I think there's a lot more openness here in USA to study the problem of race and racial discrimination than, than studying the uh, issues of caste discrimination mm -hmm. in India. Uh, uh, the high caste academician has has bypassed many areas related to caste. Economic discrimination was one. Uh, why should not they do it? The entire scholarship and research is confined to high caste here. Yeah, as a matter of fact, this is only in last 30, 40 years that the people from low caste and middle class have entered into academics. Uh, but otherwise, it has been confined to the high caste. But they have not taken study. So there is a reluctance on the part of it. But the most most disturbing feature, I must say, very, very disturbing feature is that that there has to be there has to be an opposition and support on the part of high caste to caste reform, to policies, to education. Unfortunately, there is no support. And if I may say so, there is an opposition mm -hmm. to the effort made by the low caste. This is very, very. Uh, this is a feature which is which is not found to be found as much in USA for that matter or Canada. I have been in Canada. Yeah. I give you two examples. In England, there is a whole lot of Hindu population. And sub organization brought out the caste discrimination between them. Mm. The Human Rights Commission or whatever equity commission in England set up a committee under which uh, David Moss and uh, Dhanda, these are two professors and one more. And they, they brought out a report, they, they brought out a report in which they provide evidence in support of caste discrimination. The government accepted the report, prepared the, we were planning to prepare the act. Mm against caste discrimination. Who came forward as a position? The priest of the various mm. temples and the Hindu organization came and put pressure on the uh, government. Brown, I think, the prime yeah. minister at that time. And threatened that we won't vote you. And the act escaped on the hold. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. Caste system is the product of Hinduism, Hindu social organization, which has affected the untouchables, there should be realization. They should, they should support this positive step. In California University, yeah. there was a mention of Dalit group. There was a massive opposition. Why should you have opposition? Caste is a reality. Untouchable face discrimination. Your constitution recognizes equality, your constitution ban untouchability, you set up two acts. That is the fact that, that the, the, the textbook we are going to refer to. But you oppose it. Why should you oppose? You don't accept it. The acceptance is not there. And that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, the, this, the, the elite section, the intellectual section, education, educated section is not in support of reform. Then there are issues, there are problems. Caste will change very slowly. You know, wherever colonialism gone, Christianity also followed. And Christianity has not opposed it as much as it should oppose. But at least 
After several, several years, Pope has apologized for slavery. We are yet to get an apology from Shankaracharya as a Hindu, Hindu head. On the contrary, there is a justification. There is no apology, there is no repentance that this is untouchability and very massive section of the society uh, is suffering from this. This is the most negative aspect of the uh, Indian intellectual and educated section. Uh, this is not to say, I must underline it and very emphatically, this is not to say that there are no caste reformers from the high caste. There are. There were many of them which worked with Dr. Ambedkar. When the Manusmuti was burned in Mahad, a part of the pages of Manusmuti were burned where the untouchability and other things were indicated. It was, it was the Brahmin Sastra Buddha who burned it. Uh, there are several of them uh, who were with Dr. Ambedkar. There are several of uh, high caste social reformers, middle caste social reformers. But taken together, the dominant voice is that of silence, dominant voice of the, that of you know keeping cool and at time opposing. Now, in the present period, you find that this train in support of the social organization of car is in fact increasing. So I think uh, it's a, the, 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 if the intellectual section and education sex, sex, section doesn't take initiative, who will take the initiative? And that is one of the factors which I think bring the stickiness to the caste system. I mean, we certainly have a lot of work to do on race in the U.S., but we do have the academy, critical whiteness studies, and some white anti-racism, lots more work to do, but there is some way to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of participation, a lot of participation by the whites. Yeah. I'm not saying that the high caste are not there on social media. They do, but the proportion is extremely small. But what is most disturbing is that if there are some efforts which are made against the caste system, you don't come forward. On the contrary, you oppose. Mm. You don't recognize. You are you are re 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 reluctant to recognize the uh, the that the caste system was the institutions, and we need to oppose. And I think those who say that it's, it was a colonial institution is complete bullshit. Let me use a very strong word. All those social scientists here in USA and in India, if they say that the caste system is of the colonial origin, they are wrong, completely wrong. They are distorting the facts. I don't name very, very eminent social scientists in USA had said this, and there are many other also. Manu Smuti was created by Manu. You have the test. It was practiced in ancient India, medieval India, British India. What British did is to conduct the census and estimate it numerically. That's yeah, all, nothing that is, else. Yeah. And you attribute the origin of the untouchability and caste system to the Britishers. It's a, it's a uh, dishonesty of highest order, I must say. In fact, during the British period, uh, we got little bit of a yeah. in some form yeah. or another. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for your talk. I, I had uh, one small question because this is on economics and caste. Uh, this is with regards to affirmative action. What are the economic uh, consequences or importance of uh, affirmative action in uh, political representation? Has it served any economic uh, uh, you know, purpose or it has not served any economic purpose? Mm -hmm. Because at least uh, in um, uh, government uh, recruitment, you know, when family gets uh, benefited economically, parents get benefited, children get benefited. So what is the benefit uh, the individual is getting if, uh, uh, or the community is getting uh, because he or she belongs to uh, SC or ST community in the political community? No, you are talking, you are mixing the question. You are talking of reservation in employment as well as political, you, uh, political, political reservation. Economic okay. Economic benefit, uh, economic benefit is difficult to say, but I will try to answer your question. See, political reservation uh, is important uh, or relevant. The answer is yes and no. Partly yes and partly no. I would say that. See, the, the political reservation uh, was brought in by Dr. Ambedkar in 1932 through an agreement with Gandhiji and the Congress and the British. 
is to give a rep due representation to the scheduled caste. In the absence of reservation, political reservation, they will not be represented. That was also the story for Muslims, so there was a separate electorate for Muslims. So in order to ensure that uh, re proportionate representation to the discriminated community, political reservation was brought in. Uh, the other purpose was that if they are directly represented in the lawmaking bodies, uh, they will they will represent the interests of the community. Other would not. Other can also represent, but they would not uh, represent as much as the scheduled caste would. So it was earlier, it, the idea was the representation of interest. And that interest could be represented by anybody. But Dr. Ambedkar would say that no, the interest will be representation of the interest will be preserved more properly, provided there is a personal representation. Mm. Uh, and that argument was, uh, was uh, to a greater extent correct. So it was for Muslim, it was for scheduled caste. Now women are asking. Because there is a process is discriminatory. Gender discrimination is there in the political process. Half of the population of India is women and their share in the par parliament is only 14%. Half of 14% of the population is Muslim, their share in the parliament is only 4 to 5%. So you can see the discrimination in the political process. Now, coming back to your question, I think the the representation of the scheduled caste to the tune of 16% in Lok Sabha and State Assembly helps them in number of ways. That they are able to participate in the policy making process. Mm -hmm. uh, they are able to uh, oppose the changes in the policy which harm the uh, uh, scheduled caste. Uh, so becoming a part of the policy making body helps in number of ways. There are standing committees attached to every ministry. There is a standing committee attached to the Ministry of Social Welfare and Justice. And if you look at the report of those committees, they are, uh, these reports are uh, include the policy suggestion. And most of the members of the standing committees are from uh, this background. So I think uh, to a greater extent, uh, this political representation give the share, but as well as help them to build up the policies uh, for their welfare. This is the positive side of it. But the negative side or limitation, I won't say a negative side, is that they are not able to do as much as they should do. They succumb to the mandate of the party, mm. which they belong. So they should represent the real interest, but they continue to represent the nominal interest. They are a nominal representative uh, at time and not the real representative, mm. because they have to look after, they have to act according to the political uh, ideology of their party or political mandate of their political party. Why do they do that? The reason is the following, that when the political representation was given through reservation in 1932, there was a serious debate between Gandhiji and Dr. Ambedkar on the method of election, mm -hmm. method of electorate. And Dr. Ambedkar wanted separate electorate. Mm -hmm. But he, he got finally reservation, which is the present reservation. What is the difference between the present reservation and the separate method of electing the scheduled caste or scheduled tribe? Uh, the difference is the following. The separate electorate, which, which was there for Muslim, which Britishers has given, but Gandhiji refused, and therefore Ambedkar had to make adjustment for reservation. The separate electorate is that a constituency is identified which is a reserve constituency or separate constituency. Two candidates contest the election, high caste and the scheduled caste. There may be a number of candidates with high caste and the scheduled caste. Scheduled caste have two votes, one for the scheduled caste, one for the high caste, another for the high caste. Now the scheduled caste candidate is elected by their own people. Mm. The high caste candidate is elected by their own people as well as by the scheduled caste. Now a scheduled caste candidate who is who is uh, who comes on the majority vote for the scheduled caste, he is accountable to the scheduled mm. caste. He will be thrown away if he doesn't do. So separate electorate was considered was considered to be a sort of an instrument which will send a genuine representative uh, and they will talk about their policies because they have they have been elected by their own people. 
This was not accepted in Pune Pact. The alternative method was the present method that you have a reserve constituency, and only scheduled caste candidates can contest. But all will vote, mm -hmm. both scheduled caste and non-scheduled caste. Invariably, in all the reserve constituency, the majority, seventy percent or sixty-five percent, is high caste. Okay. So invariably, it so happened that the scheduled caste candidates winning. Chances of winning depend on the high caste majority. Right. So, if a scheduled caste candidate is elected on the basis of the majority high caste vote, and then there are pressure on him, mm -hmm. he won't do as much for the scheduled caste as he is required to do. If he right. does more in the next election, he won't get the ticket or he won't be elected. Loyalty right. state. So, uh, the method of election is the reason as to why. Elected scheduled caste representative have limitation to uh, to what they should do there for their uh, the people that they represent. Mm. At the end, Dr. Ambedkar had asked for his qualified John electorate. Mm. Uh, I don't have a time to explain that, but the so the answer to your question is that the representation to the scheduled caste in proportion to the population does help, but it has its own limitation, and this limitation is because of the Limitation of the electoral method, which which give power to the high caste to elect the representative from scheduled caste of their choice. Anybody else? Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On this, you know, the there is a very good book by um, Competing Equality by I forgot his name. Uh, yeah, please. Mark Galenter, Mark Galenter, mm. from USA. Yeah. Mm. Yes, please go ahead. Recently, Thomas Piketty has written about anything like wealth inequality as compared to British Raj to billionaire Raj. And he has, like, he has told that from since 1922 to 2015, how economic inequality within the first like of one percent and last more than fifty percent, the world caste has increased fourfold. Apart from that, agriculture sensex recently has told, like, has showed the inequity in land holding, 80% and 20% among the and upper caste. And for this, um, uh, for this, what Dr. Ambedkar gave that what solution, what remedy he has like spoke about is state socialism. And recent political phenomena of getting privatized, like in privatizing public issues. So, like, how much uh, anti caste Academics or um, uh, like people who are working for uh, 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 like bringing down inequality should propose the remedies like state socialism. Is there any future for proposing this or like what other like what innovations should, like are required from academics or anti caste practitioners to propose that and bring down economic inequality among caste? Yes, I think the growing inequality in the US and Europe has been the subject of discussion, a very serious discussion. In the US, I think the, the major work is Dr. Professor Stiglitz, you know. So Great Divide is the first book. Um, Price of Inequality, the second book. Uh, in the UK, um, um, Inequality, What Need to Be Done, um, Acting Sun. So these all book have brought out the growing inequality and concentration of wealth. In fact, they brought out the concentration of wealth in the hand of few. Therefore, they talk about one percent against ninety-nine percent. You know, uh, huge concentration of wealth, income earning asset. Now, as far as Piketty's work is concerned, his very important work. I, when I was chairman of Indian Council of Social Sciences, I invited him. Yeah, I enjoyed him. Yeah. See if. Uh, what uh, his work is remarkable in the sense that uh, he has brought out the increase in inequalities in wealth and income, uh, in income particularly in in Europe and USA. And uh, the major contribution is the following: the entire development discourse, development strategy, and development discourse in USA was based on what is called the research by Simon Kuznets in mid-50s. 
Simon Kuznet works for major work on income distribution. And he has studied the economic growth of countries, major countries. Now, based on that, he had, he had put up an hypothesis, empirical hypothesis, that when there is an economic growth, increase in the income, in the initial stages, the income will, uh, there will be increase in the income inequalities, yeah. which means the relatively rich people will get more share and poor will get less. So inequality increases. But he said after some time, uh, the inequality will not increase and then it's, it will start declining. Yes. So the relationship between the economic growth and income distribution or inequality in income is such that in the initial stages inequality increase, then it stagger out and then it decrease. So that poor also benefit. Mm -hmm. That is why you see the changes. So it, it was called inverted U curve. curve of Kuznets. Now, Piketty has blown up this myth completely. Mm. Uh, Piketty argued that Kuznets was right, but it was an exceptional situation of Second World War. After the Second World War, whatever happened, that led to this uh, kind of a situation. But after that, if you take the latest data, he discovered that that doesn't happen. The inequality continuously goes on increasing. So he used a very strong, strong word that Kuznets curve is dead. And mm -hmm. so there is a Piketty curve now. Mm -hmm. And his contribution is that the, the rate of profit is more than the rate of growth, really. The, the, which is necessarily mean that uh, uh, the increase, uh, increase uh, share of the income goes to the relatively Mm -hmm. uh, reach and yeah. enterprising classes. But anyway, the major, major point is that the uh, along with the growth, economic inequality have been expanding and increasing uh, uh, unless you take the policies. So therefore, I think even before Piketty's work began, uh, there was a serious thinking even at the World Bank uh, because uh, the experience of the Latin American country, where the income had increased, but the poverty has not declined as much as it should have declined. So there was a sort of disconnect between the economic growth and the decline in the poverty. So there was a thinking, in the, even in World Bank and by the economies, that look, growth alone is not important. Growth is important. Income has to be increased. That's not the point. But you have to have a type of growth which will increase in the income, but at the same time, the share of the poor in the income will go. Mm -hmm. So that poverty will decline. So what you require is the type of growth which will lead to increase in the income of the poor. Mm -hmm. So the concept of inclusive growth, inclusive of poor mm -hmm. came. Concept of poor, poor growth came. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, this wisdom prevails. Mm -hmm. That the type of growth is important. The growth that will increase the income of the poor uh, is. Uh, is is necessary. So that consideration is uh, is very much there, and several policies of several countries are now um, governed by this consideration. In India, in 11th and 12th plan, we this this plan where inclusive growth of uh, plan where for inclusive growth, and they not only talk about the poor in general, but they talk about scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, minority, gender, woman. So they 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 what they called I use the word socially inclusive growth, mm -hmm. not only. Uh, that this it, it also provides space for the discriminated communities, disadvantaged communities. Uh, so that uh, that issue is certainly there. Was there any other point that you I missed out? State. Well, yes, I think the 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 Abedkar solution of state socialism, uh, the Abedkar solution was the following. Abedkar solution was that the land reform will not be useful. Land reform will not give land to the poor particularly to the untouchable. That is what precisely has happened. Land reform has helped OBC mm. and the class cast above OBC, but untouchable were generally bypass. So he says that uh, the if you have to have an access to the income and negotiate of land, and land reform cannot do it, the best way is to nationalize the land and distribute it uh, to the tenants, uh, to the landless labor and person. You can cultivate collectively or you can cultivate uh, individually with the assistance of the state. So land distribution through nationalization was uh, was a remedy which was suggested by Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, 
In that stage, he also argued that the ownership of key and basic industry, health, insurance, and education should be with the state. Mm. Because these are the social needs of everybody. So a very substantial uh, section of the economy, he thought that should be under the state uh, control. But uh, one particular section also he left to the uh, private uh, domain. So support for the nationalization of the K and basic industry was that if whatever profit is earned from the K and basic industry, that surplus can be used for the welfare of the people. Right. In the private economy, it will go to the individual. Right. So I think he suggested some sort of a socialism, what he called state socialism, which he wanted to make a part of the constitution and the framing of the constitution. That's why he called a constitutional state socialism mm. with a parliamentary democracy. Now, the issue is that the politics doesn't allow to have nationalization of land. In fact, the basic and key industry, which were under the government during the during Nehru and era and Indira Gandhi and other, now there is a privatization of the public undertaking. Okay. Education, insurance, and health was supposed to be in the government sector. Now there is a massive privatization of education, insurance, and the health. Mm. So the politics is going in the absolutely other way around. But that doesn't that doesn't deny the fact that you have to have a policies which will provide access to the income earning asset, land and entrepreneurship to the poor. That doesn't deny the fact that the access to the poor, to the education and insurance and health should be there. Now, what modified forms one should adopt is an issue. Mm. But the goal cannot be denied. They suggested the role of the state. Now, the state is withdrawn. Now, you, have, you depend more on the private. Now you see how private sector can be used, whereby poor are benefited. And there are there are countries, you know, in Europe, we we develop a, they talk about the concept of social market. Mm. Social market means what? The state provide health, state provide education, state provide um, uh, insurance, state provide transportation facilities, state provide many other facilities, not the market. So the, 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 the thing which are supposed to be done by the market and market are, have their own limitation to serve the poor, the state take the role. Mm. So the alternative ways of pro-poor growth, pro-poor approach have to be find it out. It is, it is because of the politics you cannot have the way it has been suggested by Dr. Ambedkar or other democratic socialists, but you will have to find out a way how do you develop the policies within the framework of private economy and market which will help the poor? Otherwise, it has its political consequences. Mm -hmm. I think that was a wonderful segue of closing today's uh, lecture. So please Can join me. Uh, we should close according to the time. We can. I think we can have um, discussions after we close. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, this Malaysia has the whatever the good uh, has been done um, is due to the I mean whatever uplifted. Um, and in fact, all the people in this room are the result of direct reservation in education and employment, right? The political reservation. I would gladly give up any time. At least that will make the you know caste tribes come together and have some level of you know fighting spirit okay but whatever has been done is because of little whatever little has been done is uh, reservation in higher education and employment and uh, according to some you know studies it's only three percent it represents three percent of the entire Indian economy and it's shrinking now okay like so much is unorganized sector so much is you know uh, private sector right so the more aggressive policies, like what Malaysia has done, like the Bhumiputra scheme, uh, where they basically made this very, you know, affirmative action, whatever you want to call, in each and every part of the you know, nation building, mm -hmm. each and every part of the, you know, uh, and primarily in the private, uh, you know, enterprise. And that type of thinking, I mean, that that as a result of that, Malaysia has really become, you know, a ordinary, you know, like 
what you call a very poor country to really mm. you know uh, uh, become a developed economy so something like that is that a, a conceivable idea because the growing sense of this private um, sector that those type of policies i know that the size of the countries are very very you know mm-hmm. hugely different but that is the one model actually very very successful in the recent times so we can draw some lessons out of that any practical implementation of such policies oh certainly i think the malaysian model is very important uh, uh, they distribute the land but the, the most innovative aspect of them was entrepreneurship development upon malayas uh, they provide all the facilities licenses capital and other thing to increase the ownership of entrepreneurship they also have hand holding from china but that have affected only limited way a benefit limited way so they really the remarkable policy was giving share in the capital to the poor to the malayas and that share was what they set up an organization financial association and help the poor to buy share and debenture of the companies so you get capital gain at the end of the year a certain amount and it helped to reduce your poverty so the ownership of share and debenture shares equity capital of the malayas increased from 7% in 1972 to about 30% in 1995 or so uh, and it was made compulsory that any foreign company or domestic company should have uh, 15 20% of shares owned by the malayas and affirmative action policy in employment and other thing but the point is this was possible simply because discriminated group of malayas are in majority <laughs> the politics <laughs> determine <laughs> everything <laughs> politics determine everything <laughs> similar policy was taken in south africa because there also yeah. the, the the blacks are in majority when they come to the power they could take a drastic step in mm-hmm. fact they they did not take as strong step as malaysia was despite the fact that the communist party black community anc was uh, in power because that there, there was an underhand dealing uh, understanding that you know there there will not be serious land reform to affect the white i think that was probably the um, one of the understanding maybe but the 10 year after the anc in power they realized that they had created a elite section among the blacks mm-hmm. so they went to malaysian model their program was black economic empowerment for first 10 year when they discovered that the limited number of blacks were helped then they got aware about it there were protest then they uh, converted it into a broad based black economic empowerment that is pro poor black economic empowerment trying for malaysia so but both example where the discriminated group of in majority and they hold the power that's not the case we should do Uh, i won't fear your suggestion of dispenting political reservation <laughs> I, I, i didn't ever give up <laughs> because you 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 that will force them to it is come together no 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 <laughs> even even if they come together yeah the possibility is that they may not yeah. but even if they come together 100% unity they still are 17% hmm. the minority cannot come to the power unless you have a right alliance or unless you have proportional share yeah mm-hmm. so, women are 52% for god sake okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they are only 14% in the parliament yeah. Yeah. economic power and so i think political reservation represent is a major instrument uh, which should be used mm-hmm. look at the look at the muslim 4% as against 14 15% population yeah. not a single muslim candidate was contested from uttar pradesh despite the fact that the population was 70% mm-hmm. when the majority ism became communal then there are serious threat to minorities and the only only way is to is to give at least share in proportion to population mm. i mean there are many of many who hold the same kanchiram hold this view you know there are i won't name there are many of them because they are disgusted you are right his question is right yeah. they are disgusted that these people go there and do nothing <laughs> but they do nothing not because they are dishonest they do less simply because the electoral method mm-hmm. compel yeah. them to be passive mm-hmm. 
perfect. The moment you bond select to uh, select uh, separate electorate, you will see that the people will because when the scheduled caste represented to know that his or her election depends entirely on his community, then he will fight because he know that next year in next election they will they will throw me away. So it's a electoral method. Right. Right. Still have time. which are way to do now. Uh, because of the reservations and all this uh, from the untouchable mm. community, so called untouchable community. But still, they face the discrimination based on the religion. Means, mm. we need to be considered Cast. the president Cast. of the India, who is the highest office in the India, when he goes to the Hindu temple. Correct? So, afterward, that Hindu shrine mm. has to be purified. Mm. So, no, the economic aspect of it, you know, one, one has to understand, I think, uh, that caste discrimination is independent of the economic strength of the person. What you are saying is correct. Caste is based of race. Caste is based of race. Is, is, is because of gender. Caste is because of caste. Caste discrimination is because of caste. Caste discrimination is because of ethnicity. Discrimination is a group concept. It is based on identity of a person. Color, race, gender, religion, region at time. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be accepted. There is no doubt about it. That even if you are economically well off, you continue, you will face discrimination based on the group identity. The Catholic and the Protestant in Northern Ireland are extremely rich communities. They are economically well off, and yet the discrimination prevails. Mm -hmm. Here also, the discrimination prevails between the economically better of uh, black, African American, and white. So, one principle one has to accept is that. Uh, that the discrimination is independent, neutral to the economic standing. Mm. So therefore, there I agree with you that the economic mobility will altogether eliminate discrimination, cause discrimination. That's not the case. Uh, discrimination will of also continue to face discrimination. The issue is this, that, that there is a strength in the economic empowerment, which has a capability to uh, reduce discrimination and to face discrimination, to resist discrimination if you are economically well off. So to that extent, the reduction of caste discrimination uh, weaken to a greater extent. Uh, therefore, if economic empowerment and education empowerment comes in, there is an economic mobility, gap gets reduced, see, contact increases and intensity of discrimination gets reduced. That's the only limited argument can we make. Uh, so economic empowerment is the solution. That's why you 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 will see that in all his program, Dr. Ambedkar focused on bullseye, give education scholarship, mm -hmm. give jobs through reservation, give land. He did not remain confined to the Untouchability Act only. Mm. But he focused on the economic and education empowerment. So I think that is very, very important. It will erode the, reduce the intensity of the caste, but it would not eliminate caste together, caste together altogether, because caste has an independent base also, which is based on the identity. And to that extent, it is neutral to the economic standing. So you have to have both. But Economic base of the caste system make the untouchable completely helpless, completely deprived, poverty sticker, and then more subject to discrimination. Mm. Uh, the 
people in the urban area who are regular salaried job they should they also face discrimination in the offices but they don't face atrocity they don't face humiliation as much as the agriculture wage laborer face in the rural area that's the only difference mm. yeah. okay. so uh, you said that uh, <laughs> the uh, you know untouchables and all that we have uh, you know uh, rights of education but i'm curious to know valmiki was i don't know what uh, if he was essay then how come he wrote the ramayana exactly. then <laughs> two vedavyasa he wrote mahabharata I think I am going to counter uh, the the question now because we are talking about this, and this can be an offline discussion. Um, if 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 the yeah. you know who who are upholding Brahminism now now nowadays, who are upholding the Brahminism? I did not mention. Yeah, is those who suffered from caste are upholding Brahminism. please so uh, you are very right you should go and ask mm -hmm. he, uh, yeah, you, you are you are very right you are very right okay. <laughs> all right so let's close let's uh, please join me in thanking professor thorat for this wonderful lecture